Welcome to another episode of the PICU RN podcast. I'm Ian Lane, your host, a nursing epidemiologist and certified PICU nurse. These episodes are intended for educational purposes only, and nothing stated on this podcast should ever be taken as medical or nursing advice. On this show, we evaluate the research and advance the science of PICU nursing. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Katherine Ryman. Katie is a PhD prepared nurse scientist and soon to be assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a phenomenal nurse researcher who has done some excellent work in critical care nursing research, most recently looking at co-patient assignments and the outcome on the referent patient uh, given specific patient assignments from charge nurses. Very interesting work. I invite you to look at her publication in uh, the journal from the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and I uh, hope you enjoy this fantastic episode with Dr. Katie Ryman. All right, so today I am here with Dr. Katie Ryman. Uh, Katie, why don't you take a moment to explain to folks who you are, um, how you got into nursing research, and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Katie Ryman. Um, I'm an incoming assistant professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. And I also am a practicing nurse uh, in the ICU uh, at local Penn Medicine Hospital. And I broadly got interested in, in nursing when I was an undergraduate at Rutgers University. And at Rutgers University, I took a course called Research and Evidence-Based Practice with Dr. Pamela D. Cordova. She's a current uh, uh, associate professor at uh, Rutgers. And just learning about the research process and learning how you can basically enact change through one study and it just downstream can really improve so many patients' outcomes and also nursing outcomes, whether it is uh, how nurses feel in the clinical setting, or it is a patient not being subject to a readmission, you can enact change in a huge way. And not only that, but it's important as a discipline of nursing that we are constantly trying to improve our practice. And without research, we really have no way of continually improving and kind of evaluating how we're doing things and if there's a better way. So that's kind of how I how I started. And when I after I took that research and evidence based practice class, I actually did a summer internship program at the National Institute of Nursing Research. And I worked with Dr. Jessica Gill and I did mm. some uh, research on traumatic brain injuries. And I basically started to learn what nursing research is. And that was kind of more of the uh, bench science component that I learned at that point. And then I was also working as a research assistant during the actual academic year at Rutgers. And the research that we were doing is kind of broadly classified as health services research. Uh, so interested in studying the organizational characteristics of the healthcare system related to nursing and how they're associated with outcomes. And this, the study that we were specifically working on at that time was looking at the public reporting of nurse staffing and how it's associated with basically how nurse staffing looks. So when we're publicly reporting these measures, do organizations behave differently? Do, do, does their staffing look different? And kind of looking at do all of these policies, ratios, staffing committees, um, public reporting, do they make a difference in how we do, how, how, what our ratios look like? And from there, I also interned at, in the office of Cory Booker uh, mm, in New York. So I got a little bit of policy involvement and then did an internship at the American Association uh, of Colleges of Nursing. And basically all of that kind of fed into nursing research is important and it's policy related. And we can not only create the research, but we can also lobby on the Hill for causes that are important. And our research will be cited 
as important elements that show that, you know, certain elements, whether it be staffing, are related to outcomes. So I feel like broadly, that's kind of like all the experiences that I had, in addition to my clinical training and a clinical externship. But I was just passionate to learn all the different ways as a nurse that you could be involved. So yeah, I I did answer. (laughs) No, it's great. I love it. I also love how it touches on the breadth of nursing science and how, you know, it's interesting because like Jessica Gill is a great example of somebody who she is a nurse, she's a nurse researcher, and yet she focuses on this sort of mechanistic thing that we typically associate with biomedical science, but because her her interest is in how it affects patients and nursing, um, it's very much classified as a nursing research enterprise. And then you, you know, take on a completely, uh, you know, seemingly different, uh, disparate field like health services research, but because your focus is on nurse staffing and things like that, it just goes to show how expansive the field of nursing science can really be. Um, I love that you have so much uh, breadth of experience in nursing science already. Um, You know, you mentioned that you still work clinically, and that's something that I find very interesting. I know for myself, the deeper I've gotten into the world of academia, um, the more challenging it becomes to manage sort of both aspects of my identity as a clinical nurse and a nurse scientist. Mm -hmm. How have you managed that? And talk a little bit about what you think maintaining your clinical practice has done for your research and vice versa. Yeah, this is something I love talking about because I think it's not necessarily well described or well known exactly what it looks like to have a PhD and be practicing clinically. And I think the hardest thing has been kind of having that time accounted for. I, uh, you know, during my postdoc and um and beyond, you know, it's been a per diem position that's been on quote unquote on my own time. Um, because unfortunately I couldn't find a way for it to be built in and accounted for as part of my effort. And, but to me, it's extremely important that I am clinically practicing. And the reason is, is that I know, I have a pulse on what the clinical world looks like for a nurse at that time. And I know the challenges that nurses are facing. And not only that, but I know that my questions are aligned with the clinical reality and important to the bedside nurse. I can show up to a shift one day and I can ask one of my colleagues what they think about this question, what they think, do they think this is important? Do they think that this is actionable? And then I could go back and work and make sure that my findings are important and relevant to the bedside nurse. And in reality, you know, they should be because we hope that bedside nurses are reading these these journals and these articles and are, you know, uh, driven to incorporate the latest research findings into their own practice. But the only way we can do this well is if we partner with them. Um, And so not only me practicing, but also involving clinical, fully clinical bedside nurses in our work. Um, And so the thing that, um, that I, that is, you know, difficult for, me right now is, you know, so I practice one day a week, but that also looks different than practicing full time. Um, And so having that lens of someone who, you know, is 100% clinical is really important. And so I'm trying to really make an active effort to involve someone who's fully clinical in most of my research or writing at this point. Um, And I think I think that's one thing that, you know, I'm trying to think about a little bit more is that we each offer something different in the team, whether it is, you know, our DNP colleagues, PhD colleagues, uh, you know, uh, 100% clinical uh, nurse practitioner colleagues. Um, And I think valuing all of those uh, contributions is really important. And I think in addition to just talking about being a clinician, this extends to building research teams that are reflective of the clinical reality. And, you know, ICU uh, and critical critical care is a team-based sport. 
and involving all our colleagues that are actually involved in that is what you know we need to be thinking about. And so even when I review papers, I'm thinking, okay, well, we're talking about uh, uh, sedation eruption. We're talking about spontaneous breathing trials. Well, we need a respiratory therapist on this because they are a key partner in this process. So I think those are some things that I am thinking about and basically like, you know, TLDR, like you, we need a study that is reflective of reality and for it to be reflective of reality, we need to have clinicians involved. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like you're touching on my next question for you already, but I, one of the things I'm very passionate about has become sort of narrowing this uh, theory practice gap that we have in nursing, this sort of chasm between the production of or the generation of new nursing knowledge through research and its implementation at the bedside in clinical practice. And I don't know right now if we can say that nursing is any better than any other healthcare profession where it st still takes 7, 10, 12 years between the time of generating that knowledge and implementing that knowledge. But talk a little bit about your thoughts on the theory practice gap and how you think we might be able to bridge that with nursing science. Do you think this is feasible to do? And what steps do you think would be crucial in making this actually happen? I think we're making really good advances with having uh, nurse scientists uh, at hospitals. So hospital-based nurse scientists, PhD prepared uh, nurses that are, you know, engaging nurses in research and evidence-based practice and, you know, supporting their projects and efforts and, you know, doing pilot studies on units. And then, you know, if those are successful, leading, leading to larger system implementation, I think those roles are hugely important. And there's more and more articles coming out now discussing uh, the hospital-based nurse scientist role and I think there's a lot of different ways that this role is implemented and some organizations are now writing about how they do it. So like the Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic are really big ones. And, uh, you know, I think that is a great role. And another avenue that PhD nurses can go besides, you know, going into academia or going into industry, you can go into a hospital and work as a hospital based nurse scientist. So I think that is a really important advancement that we have had in the last, well, I, in, yeah, in the last couple of years. But beyond that, I think there's other things we can do. I think journal clubs on units are a good way to get nurses uh, involved in the research. I was supported by my unit director to help lead a journal club on our unit. And I think it was pretty, it was very successful. And, you know, nurses would read the articles and then fill out a quiz and they would get credit for it. So they could put it towards license renewal. So I think that's one model that's a good way to uh, get nurses involved. But beyond that, in encouraging nurses and supporting them to become engaged with their professional organization. So if you're a critical care nurse, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses is one, the Society of Critical Care Medicine is another one, the American Thoracic Society. And not only does that equip you with, you know, updates on what's the current evidence, but it also gets you involved in professional development opportunities, networking. I, I think that's one great way for clinicians to get engaged and I encourage them to. Uh, and then beyond that, I mean, there's informal ways to do this too. Uh, I think there's really great med, well, they call, I believe they call them med influencers, but there are some really great content creators in specifically, I can only really speak to critical care, but great content creators that, you know, have newsletters of current evidence that they disseminate. And podcasts, I, yeah, podcasts. <laughs> I, I and so I have been getting more engaged within uh, that specific like sect of things, and I think it's great because I, the information is being offered in a lot of different formats, and so you can get it from multiple different angles. So I think that's kind of my long-winded answer. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's um, it's one of those things I think about a lot because, um, you know, in our profession, and and this is not to say anything demeaning about our colleagues on the kind of DNP side, but, you know, the sort of 
theoretical function of the doctor of nursing practice is to be the translator of nursing evidence from research to practice. But the way that this has sort of rolled out since, you know, 2005, 2006, more so has been that lots of people become nurse practitioners and go off and practice at the NP level. But that role isn't really conducive to translating research evidence. It's really a very busy role from the medical side. And the the responsibilities that our NP colleagues have, I think, preclude them a lot of the time from being able to actually do that kind of translation. And then also because their goal is to practice at the NP level, kind of practicing medicine, essentially, why would they be translating nursing related practice to the bedside nurses? It just, it doesn't seem to fit really in my mind. I can't make that make sense the more I've thought about it over the years. And so what I'm also wondering is, and you've talked a lot about this already, so feel free if you've you've already said your piece to let me know, but are there other processes that you think we should be putting in place, you know, thinking about kind of the clinical bedside nurse role and, um, you know, being for yourself, for example, being a nurse scientist and someone who's really just still in that bedside role, mm-hmm. um, what would be important for us to actually implement practice changes that at that perspective, in addition to some of the things you've already mentioned? I think you touch on two really important things. And one thing is that we don't account for the time. I I don't think well enough that clinicians or, you know, any, any provider engages in research, uh, and at their organization, we don't incentivize it enough. So being that someone starts a research project or an evidence-based nursing project on their unit, we need to incentivize and reward those efforts more to get to really encourage nurses to engage in it. And we do like somewhat on like career ladders where, you know, you can advance to the next level on the career ladder if you do a project or, or engage with a committee. But I think we can do better. Um, and so I think thinking about incentive structures for nurses to be engaged in research is one thing that I think about. Um and, you know, I acknowledge that some some structures may exist that I don't know about because, I, again, I'm not an, an administrator. I'm not an administration. But I do hear from my nursing colleagues that they're kind of like, why should I do this? Like, what's the purpose? And what am I going to get from it? Will I get paid for this time? And that's the biggest obstacle is time. And so maybe also accounting for in the position job the the job description or the job structure for this time dedicated to research and evidence based practice so i do wonder if it comes down to like the structure of the position and the time that they're spending but in addition to that what i was also thinking about when you were talking is that when i like kind of present myself as a phd nurse doing research a, bit, a common response I get is like, okay, so you're going to go for your nurse practitioner degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I try to explain to when I get that question is that I'm interested in researching the bedside nurse role. I'm interested in improving care that the bedside nurse provides. If I got my nurse practitioner degree, I would no longer be in contact in the same way with that role and understanding that role. And so I think that's a disconnect um, just in the general perception of a PhD nurse as a bedside nurse. And I will say it's not, it's not common. I am the only PhD nurse on my unit right now. And on my last hospital, there was one other one working during the time that I was working. So it's not common. I, but it, I think it's that way because we don't have positions that account for both roles. Um, so I think it's, you know, creating academic practice partnerships where you can practice as a bedside nurse and you can also be teaching and doing research academically. And one challenge with that and one thing that I was running into when I was thinking about this structure is I think a lot of it, again, I don't understand the inner workings of creating a position and accounting for that time. But I think a lot of it probably has to do with reimbursement for nursing care. 
Um, because nurse practitioners are paid differently uh, and their time is billed differently than right. a bedside nurse. And so now there are ongoing efforts to look at how nursing care is reimbursed for um, instead of part of the bed rate, maybe in more of like a fee-for-service model. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how things change as reimbursement evolves. But I think those are two things that I think about. So, you know, uh, incentivizing engagement and research and evidence-based practice by not only valuing the nurse's time, but also uh, in incentivizing and rewarding those efforts. Uh, and then, you know, creating a structure as far as a position where PhD nurses can engage in both. I appreciate that uh, sentiment about how, like, how do we liaise better and what kind of positions and, you know, um, structurally could be created or built to sort of foster those things. You know, we don't have to spend too much time talking about this because I have so many other questions I want to ask you about your research. But but something that came to mind there is I often wonder, like, whose responsibility this should be? And one of the things I'm hearing you say is it should be everybody's responsibility to some degree at the bedside, um, which might be a hard sell for some of our colleagues who don't consider themselves interested in research, as I'm sure you <laughs> you know. But um but, you know, I think some, you made a really compelling argument or case for the clinical nurse scientists in the hospital. They're really well suited for some of that work, but usually there's only one of them. They're kind of spread mm -hmm. out through the entire organization. Um, you know, when I think about our critical care colleagues at the bedside, I often wonder, you know, is it the unit-based educator? Because it's not the nurse practitioner. We know that already, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, but from a nursing perspective at the bedside, you know, if I put my RN hat on, I wonder to myself, like, I'm a good example of somebody who's passionate about the research. Mm -hmm. I have the skills and capability of being able to translate that. And hypothetically, I could apply it. And this might differ institutionally, but I often wonder, like, these things are not already built into policies and procedures. So will I, as the RN, actually be able to instantiate some of these changes given the the restrictions of existing protocols. And so I, if if you have thoughts on that, I'd be interested in you know, how can we overcome sort of the, the barrier of like, I don't necessarily have the authority to be able to institute some of these things I know might be best practice based on the new research. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, my knowledge in this area is limited, but from what I do know, I think it really depends from healthcare system to healthcare system. I think mm. different systems are in different stages of maturing on, as far as integrating research into practice, especially on the nursing science end. And because some hospitals have nurse scientists, some don't. Um, and, and in terms of what we also have to think about is what resources are available to that nurse scientist? Do they have a statistician? Do what kind of research supports do they have? Do mm -hmm. they have grant funding? Uh, you know, there's a lot of other things too that I think about, but also like what's the procedure? Do they have well-established procedures for nurses to submit a project if they want to do a research or evidence-based nursing project? Do they have a procedure for that? Do they have their own IRB board? It there's uh our institutional review board. Uh it, just thinking about things like that, because those are not only do you want to be able to submit research projects and, and evidence-based nursing projects, but you also want to be able to track what's happening in your organization and making sure it's aligned with the priorities and that it, those projects are done well and, and ethically. Uh, and so I think it's like really complicated question. I think it's really hard, but I think it's largely what what resources and like you said what resources and structures are in place to make this happen and oversight to make sure that these that these products are successful and that they're seen to fruition because I think that unfortunately it's really easy to start a project and not finish it too and it's not fair to the participants if the research does not get disseminated 
I agree. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the more recent research that you've done out of the critical care unit. Um, one of the things, you know, as nursing is becoming more expansive into like community-based health, I think there's lots and lots of nurse scientists who are studying things outside of the hospital system, which makes good sense. But there are still those of us who work at the bedside, actually, I think like 92% of RNs work in the hospital system at the bedside. And there's so many unanswered questions about bedside nursing research. And in critical care, you know, I'm in pediatric critical care, there's like even fewer nursing led research studies to guide my practice. But you recently published some really interesting work that I'd love to talk about. It's actually how I came to know who you are and how I uh, came to reach out to you. Um, so I don't want to bury the lead too much, but you uh, showed some really interesting new findings regarding um, charge nurses and their assignment of patient, uh, you know, patient assignments to um, various nurses. So I'd like to Talk a little bit about that with you. What did you do? What was the research focused on? What did you find? And what did you find most interesting about that? You can take it away. From yeah, that. I'd love to. So uh, the study was published in Critical Care Medicine, um, which is the journal of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And basically, we used electronic health record data. Well, actually, before I go there, I should basically talk about how I even got this data. So yeah, the way it worked is... So it's very hard to obtain data linking nurses to patients. So prior to even completing this research project, I published another paper where I basically used nurse metadata. So every time we chart for a patient, we sign a piece of data. So when we say their neurological assessment is within normal limits, I will sign that with my name, Catherine Ryman, RN. And so what I did was I created an algorithm which used the sig digital signatures, otherwise known as like your digital breadcrumbs that you leave behind and medication administration data. So say when I administer uh, Tylenol, I am also assign that. And basically an algorithm which says, if you charted a certain amount of times that I can basically ascertain that you were the nurse for that patient during that specific shift. And also, I validated it against chart uh, chart review where I went into the actual charts and I basically validated that I made the correct assignment of that nurse. So basically what this algorithm gave me is individual nurse to nurse patient linkages. And I was able to tell who's who that patient had as a nurse on that specific day shift. And so from there, what I was interested in looking at was within a nurse to patient assignment. So be it, you know, two to one, three to one uh, patient to nurse assignment, does the sickness of the other patients within your assignment affect the index patient's outcome? So if, uh, you know, you and me were assigned to, uh, say, come up with a random name, uh, Sarah, the nurse, would Ian's uh, illness severity affect Katie's outcome. Mm -hmm. And so basically this co-patient illness severity was operationalized as a categorical variable, which said you were either on mechanical ventilation uh, and vasoactive drips, just on vasoactive drips, just on mechanical ventilation or neither. And so our comparison group was neither. And basically we found that when you were on, when your co-patient was on mechanical ventilation and vasopressors, that you had a higher risk of mortality, the index patient. Um, and, but we actually, um, you know, and, and also for vasopressors only, we saw that, but we did not find it for mechanical ventilation only. And so basically what I theorized here is that Respiratory therapists are a really, really important uh, partner in the ICU, and they offload the uh, workload of mechanical ventilation largely. And so this is why I believe we didn't observe an effect is that this is that mechanical ventilation does not add to the workload to the same of the nurse to the same element that being on a vasopressor is where only you can titrate that vasopressor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so basically, you know, the the summary and the important points of this paper are that nurse to patient assignments are important and they're linked to outcomes. And, you know, while 
the copation effect might not be observed uniformly. It's obviously an element saying that the other patient that you're with in an assignment is linked to your outcome. And, you know, this is not the nurse's fault. Uh, this is, it is the fact of that certain patients require certain workloads and that you can't be in the patient in one patient's room at the same time as the other. And so, you know, I think what I'm interested on moving forward from here is looking at what care, specifically like processes of care, does a patient not receive because you're in that one room versus the other? Um, you know, if one patient is decompensating in one room and the other patient's due for, say, their sedation interruption, spontaneous breathing trial, does the other patient miss out on this opportunity because you're with uh, the patient in the opposite room? So I think these are some things that I'm thinking about as far as actions moving forward. I'm also currently uh, writing up a paper where I interviewed ICU charge nurses and bedside nurses on the nurse patient assignment process hmm. uh, to kind of learn what does this process look like and does it differ from institution to institution? What, what are the factors and you know, generally the thought process that a nurse goes through when generating an assignment and what's their overall perception of it. And this is looking at nurses at varying levels of work experience. So it was really interesting to hear what a new nurse says versus what a senior nurse says and how things have changed over time. And so I think this complements the, the co-patient paper in critical care medicine very well uh, because, you know, it adds more context to how do we think about these assignments and why might we pair certain co-patient illness severities together? Like, for example, we might put someone on neither with someone on both vasoactive drips and mechanical ventilation. And I, you know, that's an intentional pairing because you want a less sick patient with a very sick patient to make sure the workload is equalized. But I think those are some of the things I immediately am thinking about. And then, you know, Moving forward from that paper, I think other elements that I'm really interested in further exploring is, you know, implementation of sedation interruption, a nurse-driven uh, uh, practice that is not always done uniformly, and kind of studying that a little bit more and what are the factors involved and it, what are the information slash resource needs of the nurse in order to do a sedation interruption trial. And, you know, that directly affects respiratory therapists and their completion of a spontaneous breathing trial. So it'll not only improve the patient's outcomes, but also the respiratory therapist's experience working with nurses. So I think those are a couple of things that I've been thinking about. That's so fascinating. And it's a great example of ways that you can study nursing care specifically. And I really like the um, kind of focus on charge nurses or resource nurses, um, depending on the institution. Mm -hmm. the The whole idea that there is a science of patient assignment and that like there is a right way to do that and that it actually affects people's outcomes. It is a really, really powerful thing. I, I really, it re really resonated with me when I read it. Um, and I like some of these other ideas as well. Is this um? you're talking about asking for perspectives of folks, you know, is this like a multi-site qualitative study that you're doing or something? Yeah, it's, um, it's a, a couple of ICUs. And I, I think I was somewhere I, in the odds of like 30 ish interviews. Uh, and, uh, but I did both uh, observations of the process where I kind of took field notes and was just, kind of almost doing their asking them to think aloud and talk me through what they're doing. Mm. And then at individual interviews after that, until I reached the Maddox saturation where I wasn't getting new findings. That's great. But yeah, that was broadly. And so I, I'm currently writing up those findings now, but I think it's led to interesting findings where I'll give you one, I'll give you a preview, but in terms of even just talking with charge nurses, that even the education and training that's provided to them is not uniform at all, and sometimes does not even happen. Uh, and so it's actually, as far as the organizational side, 
we at my last institution, uh, you know, they have a charge nurse class. And I think they were thinking about maybe revising it to provide more assignment training and education. Um, for example, like simulation of like, who should you pair together and uh, kind of seeing what, how would a nurse would make these assignments who's training to be a charge nurse uh, with hypothetical patients. So I think it's led to us evaluating processes that have kind of been a given and questioning them a little bit more that maybe we should have some more structure surrounding them. Absolutely. Um, but there is also something that uh, just popped in my head about precepting uh, and how there's no training for precepting similarly mm -hmm. a lot of the times, um, and yet how crucial that is for sort of raising the next generation of ICU nurses. Um, yeah, this is also fascinating. When I think about your co, actually, let me ask you, when you think about your uh, co-patient assignment research, is there something that surprised you that you didn't expect? Obviously, the findings were novel and unexpected in a sense, but was, was there anything in particular that sort of uh, stuck with you about that? Well, I think it was funny because when the finding about mechanical ventilation only came out, uh, I was like so perplexed and I, and, and, I, and, it, and I had to really sit down and think about why why doesn't it make a difference when someone's mechanically ventilated? And I, but then when I thought about how interdisciplinary the ICU is and how we have this other profession of respiratory therapists helping us, it made so much sense. But I think what it kind of taught me is, you know, every finding has a story or meaning, uh, generally, generally, not all the time, uh, but in that uh, when you really think about it, there's a, there could be a lot more to the story. And, you know, it it's all again, again, you know, this is a retrospective cohort study it has its limitations, but I, you know, uh, there's value in, you know, just sitting down and thinking about the results and, you know, not, not just taking them at face value. Um, but I think what, uh, the study also taught me, well, beyond that is uh, it was a really big learning experience for me dealing with multi-level data because, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, patients' hospitalization date and shift, and they also have a unique nurse. So it had multiple levels. And so I really learned a lot in, in terms of it analyzing data at multiple different levels. And uh, because we were thinking about, you know, uh, a patient shift. We were thinking about a nurse patient shift. It was there were multi -level, multiple levels to the data, so it was a it was a, it was a great learning experience and learn to work with EHR data and all of the inconsistencies that sometimes come with it, which include you know a nurse getting married and being under different names and some digging that you have to do to answer some small questions. But yeah, it was it it was a really really great study that I. And I, and I think one thing that it really did for me was that I felt that it reiterated something that I knew was present in clinical reality. And to me, that's what made it such a good, like, study, not to toot my own horn, but what, what, it ma what made it so uh, interesting and so valuable was that it, there, it basically put a reality into writing that I knew was there. And that we all say all the time in nursing, oh my gosh, I was in that one patient's room all day. Mm -hmm. And I feel so bad. The other patient didn't get any of my time. And I think that's just, that's so valuable. And like, I, you know, people say it's the, the stupid questions, like the obvious questions that are important. And I think that there's something to that. I agree. Um, yeah. I mean, there's this old, uh, adage in uh, sociological research that like everybody thinks that they can be a, a social scientist and that all the findings are obvious until they're not, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is we don't actually know the answers to some of these questions until we actually systematically analyze them within this sort of research context. But then, you know, when we learn something that seems intuitive to us as clinicians at the bedside, we're like, yeah, yeah, that tracks, that makes sense. Um, but it is, I think nice and it's crucial to have that uh research validation um especially if you want to make sort of policy arguments and kind mm -hmm. of change practice 
or because the reality is like not all professional nurses think about some of those things of their own accord. Uh, and so having the research to back up sort of policy initiatives or training initiatives to sort of make sure that this becomes like a standardized practice is really important. Um, but then like what elements go into that standardized practice and, you know, mm -hmm. that's all stuff that needs to be validated and verified by the research. Um, yeah. The, it, it's so interesting. One of the other things you mentioned just there at the end about like, you know, we're, we're all nurses. We're in a patient room. The patient's crumping. We're, you know, fluid resuscitating them and titrating inotropes and yada, yada, yada. And then we remember like, okay, now that the chaos has died down, I have another patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, who's one of my um, PICU colleagues. And we were talking about the almost impracticality or like virtual impossibility of doing all the things for multiple patients that they need. And the reality is like, we have thousands of tasks, depending on how you code tasks, nursing tasks, mm -hmm. Uh, which is a problem in and of itself that we are mm -hmm. supposed to do for each person to be an extension of that patient for 12 hours, that it's virtually impossible to do all of them for multiple people. Mm -hmm. And then when they're both critically ill, you know, it's like, which one suffers or how do they both suffer from you being only one person and from being understaffed? So there's innumerable different questions that you might ask based on some of this really important work that you've done. But I think it's really important what you're doing and I really value and appreciate the the work that you've put out there for us. Yeah, and you and you touched on too. Quantifying workload is so hard. There's so many different ways to do it and yeah. to do it properly is it's so is such a difficult feat. Uh and I think you know in some ways you could say co-patient illness severity is a proxy for workload, but it really is not, it only just touches on it because there are so many other things that go into nurses' responsibilities that we're not thinking about. Um, even when we're just thinking about for the qualitative study, the building a conceptual model of like all the elements that go in. So like thinking about it right now, we were like their hospital level, there's unit level, there's patient level, there's nurse level, mm -hmm. there's, it's, it's so complicated and it extends beyond the unit itself. It extends to the entire hospital and what the census looks like. Because we know right now, nurses are floating to other units. My, uh, you know, my last shift I was floated. Um, and because there are demands other places. Uh, and it's, so you might say that you have, say, for example, 10 nurses on, but when, staffing meeting comes, you might lose one of them who gets floated. So the reality might look a little different. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, these are complicated concepts and it's important we're trying to quantify them, but, you know, we can get at someone's sickness by looking at you like vas uh, vasoactive drips and mechanical ventilation, but that doesn't touch on behavioral aspects that might also add to workload, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, it, it, I acknowledge that, you know, there are limitations and, you know, of course, as the research saying is more work is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I like that you touched on the sort of hierarchically nested elements of these like multi-level uh, approaches to thinking about this problem, because it really is a multifactorial complex issue um, being you know, an RN nested within a unit, nested within a hospital system. Like there are lots of really complex pieces to that puzzle. Um, I have just a couple last questions for you. One of the things I'm wondering, a kind of out of order here is like, what do you see over the next, say, like five years of your research as being where your direction will be headed with your clinical research per se? Yeah, I think I see myself moving towards focusing on sedation interruption and uh, spontaneous breathing trials and kind of improving that workflow and making sure patients get the requisite care. Uh, but I think broadly, I'm still always interested in the systems level research being that, you know, understanding staffing and assignments and how we can and even just the work environment at large and how we can improve these 
large system level concepts to improve a nurse's want, like desire to stay at their organization and to improve the patient's outcome satisfaction and other elements. Um, but I think one thing that I really want to get out a little bit more is what can we do at, at the ground level for the bedside nurse to not only help them deliver care in a way that they're doing everything they can for that patient, because, you know, nurses have the intention that they want to deliver the care to give the patient the best outcome they can. But the system, unfortunately, gets in the way a large amount of the time. And then they get, you know, quote unquote, moral distress uh, because they can't deliver the care that they would like to give. And so, you know, I'd say in large, my goal is really to support the nurse and help alleviate these barriers and constraints to, you know, delivering this care, but also equipping them with the evidence that they can also deliver the best care that is evidence-based and evidence-concordant. So I, I think kind of that is my goal and what my role is. And uh, but I, I I think it will probably be towards some ICU specific practices, which I'll end up like honing in on a little bit more. But that's my overall goal. And I think one of my things that I really want to stand by is making sure that my colleagues at the bedside are involved in my research and the process. And, you know, I'm not just studying bedside nurses, but I'm studying with them as well. I like that that framing a lot. Yeah. Uh, on that note, what would you say, or I guess what advice do you give your bedside nursing colleagues when it comes down to how to continue to elevate their practice and integrate some of this research into their, their practice? Like, do you have advice that you would give folks listening? Yeah, I think broadly the things that I if I was just starting out at the bedside and, and interested, interested slash, you know, wanting to learn more about research, like I said, you know, getting involved in your professional organization is a great way to start. I, and, you know, when you become a member, you will get journals. So I, uh, for example, like the uh, American Association of Critical Care Nurses journal. Um, and so that'll kind of give you an idea of what evidence is being put out there and what kind of studies are getting done. And I think, you know, you can also do the read them and get CEUs, which is another great perk. Uh, but I think reading more research studies and getting like used to reading them, it's going to take time. It's, it's a different type of reading. And I think that it, took me a while when I was first starting out my PhD to kind of know what to look for and how to read a study. And I think that's where you can tap into your nurse scientist and, you know, let them know what you're looking for too. I mean, do you want like a, a seminar on uh, how to ask a research question? Do you want a seminar on how to go, how to present at a conference to submit an abstract? I think, you know, hospital systems want you to go to conferences. They want you to make, you know, make them look good, uh, you know, present your work, improve the healthcare system and how care is delivered. But I think we also need to make sure that we're giving, giving nurses the education and the resources to do these things. So maybe that's a scholarship to go to NTI, you know, maybe giving them the support and resources they need to build an abstract. So I think it's not only the advice I'd give to bedside nurses, but I think also on the other end, the advice I'd give to healthcare systems to have those structures in place to support the nurses to do those projects and those, uh, and, you know, uh, funding and supporting these efforts and encouraging them, I, I think is, is a large, a large aspect. And I think it's not that people don't want to do this work. A lot of times they just don't know it exists. So bringing awareness. Absolutely. That's fabulous. Um, 
so I, we're coming up rapidly on time, but I wanted to ask you one last, probably selfish question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, being in a similar predicament um, where, you know, I will be doing, you know, sort of uh, the doctorally prepared nurse research role simultaneously trying to maintain a clinical practice the more that happens the more i realize this like kind of push pull with the two roles where it's difficult to manage both and i know that there are very few of us out there doing both um because there are so few doctorally prepared nurses out there but for those of us who are um what sort of advice do you have for how to blend the two roles and how can i mean I know this is probably still a work in progress for you as well, but like, do you have insights or inklings into, you know, what would make this blending functional or more feasible? Like I sometimes think about the uh, protected time that mm -hmm. some physician scientists have, like, what are your thoughts on building protected time for clinical practice out of a school of nursing as a faculty member or building protected time for research? If you're a hospital based, like, what are your thoughts on how to navigate that? Uh, yeah, capacity? I just don't understand the financing, which is my biggest barrier here. But mm. if the 20% could be the one di clinical day a week, then that would be like beautiful and perfect. But I just don't know realistically on the administrative side and financing side, what that would look like. I, you know, I, and, and maybe I'm not, you know, I think about this too. Maybe I'm not thinking about it the right way. Maybe instead we should be working a week every certain amount of time at the bedside because, you know, patients suffer from not getting the continuity. Well, you know, evidence, I'm, you know, assuming the evidence supports it, uh, patients suffer maybe not getting that continuity uh, potentially. And, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that I think about too, is that, you know, I work one day a week, a patient's getting a nurse that they're not going to see again for an, a whole week, assuming they're still there. So should we be working a whole week at the bedside and then have off for several weeks? So I think there's a lot of different ways to think about this and how it would play out. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm still working on this, like what is the best way? And I, it's so hilarious because I changed the day that I was working once a week, like several times to refine it. And I learned Friday is the best day because people check out of the office early. So I don't miss as many emails uh, because, you know, I'm working, I'm not on my phone. I, like I'm, I, you know, I'm clinically, my mind's in a totally different place. So Fridays was my day. Uh, and so I think it's kind of learning that workflow, um, but I kind of made it and it accepted uh, element in, in my lab where I was doing my postdoc, where on Fridays, I'm not going to be answering email because I'm in the hospital and in the ICU that day. And, but, you know, I guess my point is, is that, is this one day a week model the best way? I'm not sure. Uh, and I, I, one other thing I guess that I think is important um, is, you know, what I'm trying to do now with my clinical role is like when I get invited to write something, uh, I try to ask nurses on my unit to work with me on it. Um, in addition to others who are, you know, more in the academic space, but asking one of my colleagues at the bedside to work with me on it because they are hundred, like I said, a hundred percent clinical, they have different input that is valuable. And so engaging them in, with, of course, if they would like to, but I, you know, uh, engaging them in that writing process and supporting each other and mentoring each other, I think is one thing that I'm really trying to do. But uh, yeah, I think that's kind of largely, I, I try to kind of turn off my research, research task, like my, whatever I have going on academically on the on my research end, I try not to think about that completely when I'm in the clinical space. And that doesn't mean that I, you know, am not thinking about better ways of doing things. Like that's absolutely something I'm thinking about. And right. I'm thinking about what are things that need to be improved? What are potential uh, studies that I could do in the future based on problems that I'm running into? Sure. But also you need to be present for your patients. And so I think 
You know, I heard someone recently, a physician scientist who was like, you have to be the triple threat. You have to be good at teaching, good at clinical and good at research. And that is really hard to do. And I think that is so true. Uh, you know, I mean, you were there one day a week, you're not going to learn and you're not going to, uh, you know, accumulate as much knowledge as someone who's there, especially when things change, when you get a, get a new device on the unit. So those are the things that are going to come with not working as often and are going to be things that you're going to have to work harder on. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's tough, but you know, it's, uh, you just do your best. So. Absolutely. Dr. Katie Ryman, thank you so, so much. This has been wonderful. It's been a pleasure and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me.